So purpose for destinations. Um, what we're gonna do in this particular workshop is challenge you to think about the existential idea of tourism. So we're not talking just the industry, we're not talking just visitors, we're talking the whole large idea of experiences and economy and all those things that surround the meaning, value, purpose and lived experience of tourism. Now that'll settle, settle in a little bit as we get there, but we're talking about tourism in its largest sense, as opposed to small specific segments, which we'll get to. And when we do this today, we're going to talk about what is a purpose. We'll talk about some purpose driven brands. We'll talk specifically about how it is related to destinations. And then we'll do some work around helping Canmore find uh, some purpose, just not the final answer, of course, but some thinking along the way and uh, all the way along questions and answers. Now, this is an interesting observation that in the past, destination marketing has been about crafting messages to attract tourists. And now it's a much more complex pursuit that needs to start with citizens, local residents, and create and generate a quality of life experience for them. Um, and some of the actual thinking around purpose is, is if we think of our community as citizens rather than residents, it kind of changes our, our framework on, on how we engage with them. So we haven't done too much of that, but it is an interesting observation. Um, so let's talk about tourism purpose. And it's actually, in some senses, easier to understand what it's not. So the first example is we're not talking about corporate social responsibility or philanthropy. Those are different things that businesses will get involved in. And uh, not saying they're, I mean, they're obviously very important and very useful, but our idea of purpose is bigger than that specific thing. It's also not about purpose-driven travel. This is where people, it's also called volunteers, and where people will go often to third world countries and do volunteer work as their vacation experience. Very meaningful, not what we're talking about here. Uh, probably most critically, if it's just an advertising campaign, it's a disaster. Uh, this was the Kendall Jenner Pepsi campaign where she was able to resolve a peace protest by bringing a Pepsi to a cop and it was so bad it lasted about 24 hours in the media before it was pulled. And it's an example of uh, agencies of which uh, all three of us at Stormy Lake have been part of in the past um, are really trying to take this idea of purpose and create a campaign and that's not at all what we're trying to get to either. And then finally, we're not talking about purpose as a financial opportunity to get money. Yes, there are interesting green funds that you can invest in in the stock markets, but from the point, point of view of today, this is not a place we're going down about financial opportunity. So that what it isn't, what is it? And simply stated, we define purpose as a reason for an organization to exist beyond profit. Profit's important for most businesses, if not all of them, we're trying to look what goes beyond there. And it's like a moral compass that defines why a destination exists and guides decisions on what they do and how they do it. And a really interesting example, flipping back and forth to the product world, is Patagonia. Is that they sell clothing and equipment for the outdoors, their promise, their brand promise, build the best product and cause no unnecessary harm, which is quite lovely. But their actual purpose as an organization is to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. That's a much bigger idea than making money selling jerseys or, or whatever else. And even if they're trying to build a great product with no unnecessary harm, it's still not quite as elevated as this idea of inspiring and implementing solutions to the environmental crisis. So why does this matter? Why is this a global issue that's uh, growing in momentum? The first one is people are really desperate for change. Only one in five people today believe that the system is working for them and large majorities ex express a sense of injustice and a desire for change. Like this is not a small number of people who have concerns, it is a very large number of people. And in that uh, realm, people really want the brands and the destination to be part of the solution, not sitting on the sidelines as they get there. Nearly two thirds of surveyed consumers prefer to purchase products and services from companies that stand for a purpose that reflects their own values and beliefs and will avoid companies that don't. 
And specifically in the tourism world, 58% of travelers choose not to visit a destination if they feel it negatively impacts the place or the people who live there. Now, those are pretty impressive numbers, but huge caution. 30% of consumers say they want to make ethical purchasing decisions, but only 3% do. Like there's a real drop off between intention and action. And there's lots of really good reasons why this happens. But uh, when we go back, if I go back a couple of slides and talk about how two thirds prefer to purchase products and services, the actual number who do is gonna be much smaller than that today. But that number is improving. Improving in the sense of more people whose actions are following their intention. And when a destination communicates and acts on its purpose, it can better connect with visitors over shared values and better differentiate itself from their competitors, both of which are supremely important for long-term success. We've also seen some really interesting examples where some brands, um, their social, environmental, or political causes are more naturally aligned with their purpose. And we'll go product for a little bit first, but this is a very interesting one. Patagonia, beautiful campaign, the president stole your land. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and talking about the fact that these national parks or national monuments were decertified and Patagonia took a strong issue on this. So this campaign is all about their values, all about their purpose, and got nothing to do with their product, but they fit together really nicely. More common one that I don't think is quite as fancy, but still really cool, is Tom's One for One campaign. Every time you buy a pair of shoes from Tom's, they'll donate one to the third world. And so it's a really a nice example of, um, again, the direct tie between your customers and the purpose that you're living as an organization. Snowmass, Aspen Snowmass has created a give a flight campaign, which basically funds money, uh, raises money for environmental causes that are naturally important to them as a ski resort. And they do this in such a way as it's not seen to be self-serving, which could be a great risk uh, that if Snowmass is saying, hey, save your glaciers, but they are able to quite successfully build it out as a campaign. We also don't need to try and save the world every time we have a purpose-driven um, area. And it can often be an, a value or a belief system that's shared between the brand and the customers. And I actually think this is a particularly interesting avenue to consider in Canmore. Um, so Carhartt has this lovely ad, to those who taught us the spirit of hard work, thank you. So this is about the ethos of the working man the working woman that is Carhartt's purpose. So they're not trying to save the world. They're really trying to honor that kind of person and the kind of work that they do. REI Co-op, which I didn't realize until recently was actually the Mountain Equipment Co-op inspiration, uh, closes every Black Friday in the US, believing it's far more important to go out and enjoy the outside than to buy something else. And that's a really big way to live their values uh, when that is the single largest shopping day in the US and they're saying, you know what, we're just closed. And so they want their employees to go into the outside and they're encouraging their customers to do the same thing. So again, that's not trying to save the world, but really taking a purpose-driven stance on the issues that they have. So I realize I'm doing this little blurb in record setting time, I'll just slow down. So if that's a lot about brands, what about destinations? Um, and this is the idea of developing an overall purpose of a place. And here's why it's so important from a marketing perspective. Because at the end of the day, most destinations share very similar product attributes. Cities all kind of look the same. Mountains all kind of look the same. Beaches all kind of look the same. It's really hard to stand out on some of those physical uh, assets when there's other places around the world. And we really are in a global environment for comparison, if not actual competition. Um, and defining a purpose can help destination brands really differentiate themselves from competitors. And again, we can see it in the brand area, Tom's, Patagonia, Airbnb does it in their own way, Nike, REI, Carhartt, all very purpose-driven brands. 
But when we start to think about purpose-driven places, it gets a lot harder because not a lot of places have really done a great job of moving into this turf with one massive exception I'll show you in a couple minutes. So what's the big challenge? The big challenge is, to be quite honest, that the purpose of the place is often different than the purpose of the destination marketers. So the people charged with promoting it aren't necessarily having the same goals and direction in mind as the larger idea of the place itself. And I'll come back to the most important point is, we're talking about a reason for being beyond tourism profit. Now we were just this past summer out on Vancouver Island doing some work for a destination, uh, talking to people. And uh, our colleague Charlie is approaching, and he's a really good interviewer, approaching a woman on the beach. And she says, I don't want to answer your questions because I don't want more people to come here. This is a sign of love of the destination, which is fantastic, <laughs> and a sign of disconnect with the tourism industry, which isn't necessarily quite so fantastic that's going on in there. Um, she ended up putting us in contact with her husband who talked for 20 minutes, but um, she was absolutely adamant that uh, she did not want to contribute in any way, shape or form to more tourism coming to the area. So when we look at the destination, we've really got uh, three key priorities. There's a need for the engagement and alignment of tourism stakeholders. There's a need for the differentiation and appeal for visitors. And there's a need for community support and social license for the local community. And you're trying to solve all three of those things. And when you've got them all working, you're really creating a sustainable, uh, sustainable model. And we can look at it this way, that when there's a shared purpose, the engagement and alignment of tourism stakeholders, the social license from community and the destination, sorry, differentiation appeal from visitors will all be working hard together. But when the breakdown happens, if for example, the community is not buying in, they will reject tourism in the destination. When the tourism stakeholders don't buy in, you'll see rebellion and they'll reject the industry and fight it out on their own. And when the visitors don't buy in, there'll be recession and they're just not gonna show up. So let's take a look at Port Alberni for a second. So Port Alberni um, positions itself as adventure central and that does a pretty nice job of describing why visitors come to visit. The community very much wanted a vibrant waterfront community that could be built. And that was aligning well enough with Adventure Central that they could share their purpose. The tourism stakeholders wanted revenue and fairness in the collection of the hotel tax and nothing else. And they started to reject the whole idea of tourism that was going on and they had a broken model. It took them years to get that fixed. Uh, <laughs> We certainly don't want to see this, but this is the kind of stuff that's going on in Spain with the community out there saying, um, this isn't working for me. And there's a great speaker who uh, from the US who frequently well, actually living in Scandinavia now, he's a Canadian living in Scandinavia, um, big thinker in tourism, Doug Lansky says, if tourism doesn't work for locals, it doesn't work in my mind. A city can have tourists, but the tourists shouldn't have the city. For example, using some of the money from tourism to have some free days at museums for locals and book times for locals, so they are not just putting up with the crowds of tourists all the time, they're getting a nice benefit too. And now, while that's a rather tactical solution, I think this idea of the tourists, the residents getting a benefit from tourism is really important. Let's take a look at Venice, which until this last year had huge problems. What's going on in Venice? The visitors are all about gondolas, art and history. The tourism stakeholders are about more and more visitors and the community saying, I just need a place to live. Like you guys are killing me. There's nowhere to go, there's nowhere to stay. This is really difficult. And we were seeing rejection of tourism by the community. Now I told you there's a great example out of there, out in the world, and it's actually Antarctica, which wasn't the place we expected to see it, but they do a magnificent job. So from the visitor's perspective, they're going for a peaceful place of scientific discovery, cleansing and energizing. 
The community is all about Antarctica and the Southern Ocean, valued, protected, and understood. And the tourism stakeholders are there to advocate and promote the practice, practice of safe and environmentally responsible travel to the Antarctic, all united around a principle of protection and discovery. This is probably the best example in the world of, the, of being in balance and working really well together. And it comes way out on things like the visitor experience where um, this uh, reporter was talking about how you truly have an exceptional experience because you learn a ton by people who are personally invested and passionate about the region as they come together. And it's a really nice, uh, you don't just sort of on paper see this balanced model of what's coming together, but it really comes out in when people report their experiences as what's there. Now, if anyone asks who exactly is this community in Antarctica, there's actually a coalition of, I think, seven countries that are jointly managing the Antarctic community, and that's where it's particularly coming from. It's not like there's a whole bunch of waterfront houses you can rent. So let's take a look at Whistler. Um, and uh, this one, I'll sort of give you an inside story on this that goes into. Um, he, Whistler is interesting because it is an uh, unarticulated balance that has been seen but not endorsed. So visitors are looking for all round adventure, luxury and authenticity. The community wants to work hard and play hard and the tourism stakeholders want sustainable growth and the constant flow of new visitors. So everyone in one degree or another is looking for some kind of balance, but they've shied away as a community in bringing those three things together. And so they're still having some tension in Whistler, again, this last year being a, a weird variation on that, uh, but balance is really at the core of what everyone's looking for. So I don't know, didn't quite know how to disconnect this one, but it's, it's all there, they just haven't put the pieces in. The other thing I want to point out is that not every destination is going to have a purpose. Sometimes they're just super popular. So it's not that you mandatorily need one. And I think an interesting discussion for us to have um, in the task force is, is there a place for a purpose in the work in Canmore? Uh, we think yes, but it's not like you don't survive as a destination without it. Um, and then the other one is, um, there's also places that, and this is probably the Whistler example, that share a purpose, but just have never talked about it in a particularly coherent way. Um, and that can be an issue. Any questions yet? Okay. Um, so we just wanted to share with you a little bit of um, what we saw being learned in BC during COVID that related to the social license for tourism. And so this is based on some work that was done in the lower mainland and up the coast, a whole bunch of communities, literally from as large as Vancouver to as small as you can get, and, um, and what we saw. The first one was that COVID really increased community concerns about tourism and that there was increased tension that didn't necessarily be there before. Businesses were welcoming tourists back, some residents saw the economic benefit, but other residents, often seniors, did not want visitors in the community. And it was really sensed that the, the economic value of a visitor was not being fully appreciated. And so, uh, sorry, and then further in other communities, the businesses were not openly advocating for the visitor economy, which is creating further tension. And uh, when you had been a community that already had some angst about what visitors were doing to the local place, COVID made it particularly worse. And these were often places that had natural sites and historic sites and environmentally sensitive sites. Um, uh, these issues became more important. So COVID made it worse or more important perhaps. Uh, quote, lots of emotion going on, hesitation, anger, and feeling that visitors aren't even wanted. Businesses aren't using the voice to say, we need this to keep us going. It was a, a prevalent a discussion from the smallest to the largest groups. Um, and uh, we have amazing natural assets that people want to come see, but community is the new norm of trying to find the balance of carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is actually a, a, a concept that Doug Lansky, we saw a few minutes ago, uh, did. And that's basically the natural ability of a destination to hold visitors and move them around. And that that needs to be fundamental to planning 
and that sense of what is the balance of carrying capacity has been changing. We also heard people talk about the fact of a shift to resident focused tourism in, in being far more engaging with residents as to what's happening, building ambassadors in the community. And uh, don't you love this quote? We've never done that before, but it's really valuable. So <laughs> some of the destinations being a little slow to the table in figuring out how important it can be to get the community on board. So lots more to that, uh, but we did want to skip to some promising practices. And uh, one of the questions we asked is, if your role has always been destination marketer, what are some of the other roles? What are some of the other jobs you're finding that you have to do in this new world? And so uh, one of them was they needed to be almost therapists or counselors, listening and showing empathy to all parties, community visitors, destination British Columbia politicians, and trying to keep everyone happy. So that was new. They found out that they needed to be educators. And that was not necessarily educator to the community as to why tourism mattered, but educated to visitors on how they should be good visitors and the things they needed to do within the community. Inspir inspirational messaging, simultaneously talking about how to manage the destination appropriately. There needed to be motivational speakers to get people excited about traveling and being hopeful about the situation. And they really needed to be entrepreneurs. And it was fascinating to listen to destinations talk about these new skill sets uh, that they needed to become expert at really quickly. And I'm sure Rachel could add two or three to this list with what's going on in Canada. Uh, five different things were effective in this area of social license. Uh, the first one was a Locals First campaign. There was enrolling locals into the tourism business, healthy behavior messaging, tourism cares, and helping manage the demand. And just to look at these a little bit deeper, um, a lot of people were saying that they just went in and said, we love our place. And it was marketing the importance of tourism to the local community. Um, one great place in Delta, they created uh, people, they have a potato-based economy and people weren't eating potatoes was an issue. So they held French fry uh, days to celebrate the local economy, which really got people interested. Um, so the fact that a fry truck could be part of a tourism campaign just makes me smile. So we wanted to connect that on. Uh, I know you guys have seen these pledges that have been going around in different places, but the Pemberton pledge, uh, we are tourism hashtag, a number of these ideas of getting people to be bought into the tourism community rather than simply being an audience the way locals can be, uh, works quite well. A lot of work around healthy behavior messaging. Uh, right at the beginning of COVID, it was the old six feet apart, wear a mask and those types of things, but it moved on and on to being codes of conduct for tourists, um, how to experience particular places. And this is something we're certainly gonna wanna consider later on in the project as we get there. Um, and what was interesting is uh, sometimes the tourism agency isn't the right person to give a tourism message. It needs to be done by someone else. And I think a power of the, what we're doing what you're doing here in Canmore is the fact they've got so many other people involved that can give a credibility that individual groups can. Um, another one uh, that worked very well was uh, showing that the tour tourism industry was really supportive of other sectors that were really stressed by COVID. Um, I think that continues to be a viable strategy to look at. Um, and uh, a, a lot of the, in some places, there was huge anti-Albertan sentiment running around and they wanted to approach that with kindness and understanding rather than judgmentalness, judgmentality. Um, and then finally is um, the responsible usage of attractions and experiences was something that was worked and they really saw that as the most important long-term strategy um, as it came together. And then uh, finally, there was a real identification of the need for new partnerships. And so better relationships with other destinations was seen as important relationships with the local municipalities, some chambers of commerce, although uh, that model doesn't work uh, equally well in different parts of BC, uh, business improvement associations, uh, residence associations. These were all places where better relationships needed to be built to deal with the social license issue. Um, blah, 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 get more. Don't need to worry about that too much. And then uh, 
these communities had all been dramatically changed and basically saying long term, we need to be making sure as we consider the value of tourism, yes, we're talking about the economic impacts, but we're also talking about a sustainable lifestyle for visitors, the prosperity, quality of life and pride in place, um, bringing local flavors to the uniqueness of the area and improving the livability of community. So there's a real idea that the value of tourism is so much more than the economic value, which gets us right back to this idea of um, the purpose. So questions before we move on. Yes, Carol. Um, if I, just on your last slide, um, it was an interesting thing that tourism improves the livability of communities. Um, yeah. so, that was able to be communicated and yeah, well I would so um, I would say the tourism community can kind of overstate that but the community really underappreciates it so often uh, the you can have sort of sort of recreational things that tourism is fundamental to su supporting that you can't do it without it. And in fact, a lot of tourism attractions can't be done without the local community either. But that fact gets missed in a lot of communities. They overlook the fact that, I'll just give an example from another community, that bouldering thing, which is so much fun to take your kids to, is only there because there's visitors. Mm -hmm. But you also have to recognize that you couldn't pay off a bouldering thing if you didn't have locals to also support in that other part of town. So that real symbiotic meshing of those two things is really critical and a lot of communities miss that. A lot of people in communities miss that, obviously not everybody. Thank you. Yes, John. Yeah, thanks. And I really appreciate the presentation. Um, you had the three prong um, diagrams with the, the three bodies of, of the major stakeholders and um, each one of them sort of had a different you know, uh, interest. Uh, when we're looking for our purpose, we're looking for that spot in the middle where the, yeah. all of those interests overlap. Yeah. And so what we're going to do in a couple minutes, Sean, is we're going to just throw out uh, a rough one and start to see where you'd line up against that. But in an ideal okay. world, you would all share the purpose and then address it in the way that you need to for what your business does. So you're going to right. obviously have a different way to articulate it if you're one versus the other versus the third. But ideally, you're all working towards the same thing. Great. Thank you. I don't have a question, but yeah, it, I have a comment. Um, just what's striking for me in the presentation material that you've provided, um, Philip, is, is, is just how um, widespread and universal these conversations are between destinations um, that there there's it seems to be and um, I had shared on slack uh, a day or two ago a couple of slides that um, I took uh, as screenshots from the impact uh, conference the tourism uh, conference which is just a couple hour conversation but it was it really showed the growth in tourism over the last three years um, at a you know, a constant increasing year over year rate. And, and what, what's happened with COVID with the precipitous drop in tourism is that collectively, the world is catching its tourism breath is sort of what I'm seeing is, is that it's, it's not just Canmore, it, it's everywhere. And so there's a reckoning that that's happening and, and maybe as tourists as well, because I know we all love to travel and, and, and visit destinations that there's, there's something that we have to change within ourselves too. So that's just a comment and an observation. I, I totally agree. Um, so yesterday, the head of the Chamber of Commerce in Calgary said that one in 10 jobs in Calgary is part of the tourism economy. Uh, and I was shocked it was that high, but I mean, and that's the kind of number that wasn't appreciated. And I think COVID has really brought to light the role of tourism in the economy, but also brought to light the, the impact of tourism on the world around it. And I re I'm really glad that people are doing something about that, to your point. And I think it is quite widespread. I'd have to be very honest with you and say, historically, you could put Canmore on one of those broken tripod things <laughs> with what's going on. 
And I think you have the potential to move from broken tripod to really healthy tripod in just a few years, which is pretty exciting as well, because there's a, a case to be made that you certainly had one or two breakdowns over the last decade to consider. No other, oh, sorry, yes, Sally? No, actually, I can see Michelle has her hand up. I'm not sure how oh, you're, sorry. Philip, if you want people to just jump in or. Oh yeah, just, just yell it out. I can't see Michelle on my screen. Um, yeah, so my guess question or thought is, I think somewhere in the presentation, excellent presentation, um, you mentioned that there are some communities, some destinations that don't really re require a purpose because they already have a lot of tourists coming to their community. And so for a place like Canmore where COVID and prior to COVID, you know, we in a lot of ways were maxing out on tourists anyway. So then how do we define our purpose to encompass everyone who's coming anyway, as well as our new destination purpose people? Uh, great question. I think that, um, Nicole, you'll know the quote, but like sometimes a carrot is just a carrot kind of thing that whatever the famous psychology quote is, look to Nicole for all of those. But sometimes a beach is just a beach and you don't need to go much bigger than that. I don't think that's the case in Canmore. I think the fact that you're popular and you're bursting in the seams and you have tensions <laughs> and you have historic issues really says you, you would desperately benefit from a purpose being part of the tourism framework that people can align behind as you get there. So I think you really, I think it'd be a great thing for you to have. You, I think oh, I, 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 I agree. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I agree 100% that I think a purpose and a, and a destination and a more sustainable, you know, whole yeah. outlook for tourism is absolutely necessary. But, um, you know, it's just, You've are, it's not like we're trying, I don't think, to draw more. I know we always are focusing on the quality theoretically versus the quantity, but I, you know, it's, I just find it hard to see and I can't see it happening. How do we get, how do we decrease that quantity that's still going to come? Yeah. And that's but just a thought. Yeah, absolutely. And that, um, I'm going to refer back to your thought in just a second because I think there's something mm -hmm. very interesting in what you're saying. But yeah, no, I'll just, I'll come back to that very shortly. Yes, Norbert. Uh, Philip, a question about whose perception or purpose are we talking about? Uh, you know, I'd like you to appreciate your comments on, we might have a sense of purpose of our community as a place for people to visit. Um, what if that's different than the purpose our visitors think we have? Um, so, if we want to build something sustainable, we need to care about what purpose the visitors have. And, and you can get at that through a lot of tourism research will give you a pretty good sense of what's going on in that zone. Like we want to care that visitors share a purpose with the tourism industry, with the community. It works when all three of them are working together. So um, as we build it, we're gonna to wanna to look at all of those perspectives to make sure it's happening. And I'd add in um, neighbors as well. Um, sort of undefined a little bit. Okay, let's go on a little bit and we can come back to all of this discussion as we go. So now we want to start the thinking process of what might be a purpose for Canmore. And uh, this is where, Michelle, I'm gonna refer back to your comment, is there's really kind of three parts of this is agreeing on where to go, agreeing on how to get there and getting there together. Because almost the easiest part, and Norbert, to your point as well, almost the easiest part is to say, here's a purpose, let's all agree on it. The trickier part is what we're gonna do about getting there and everyone getting there in their own way. And I think the how many visitors we want is actually part of the second question, not part of the first question. So today we're only really gonna be talking about that first one, but if we're really to embed some of these ideas into the tourism framework, the framework needs to talk about how to get there, not just on where to go, if it's ever going to work for you sustainably over time. So we'll let that thought. Uh, but finally, there is good news. And the good news is the smaller the place, the easier it can be to find a shared purpose and would put Canmore on the smaller side rather than the bigger side of trying to challenge this exercise. Venice would be a killer. 
um, even though they desperately need one too. In Canmore, we've got something we can work with. Um, and as we do this, we're going to want to talk about the tourism industry, the visitors, and the local community. Um, and we're going to start uh, with you guys on the task force as we get there. So here's the most controversial thing I'm going to say today, and that is imagine only for this exercise, can I caveat that enough? Only for this exercise, <laughs> that the purpose of tourism in Canmore was to be an authentic and sustainable mountain town experience. Now we pulled that out of some stuff that's floating around in Canmore that's purpose E. Uh, we're never gonna say this is where we wanna go to, but what we wanna do is against this, do an alignment check. How do things go? So this is only for the sake of debate, to be an authentic and sustainable mountain town experience. And we're going to look at um, what this would look like on a purpose map. So Nicole, do you want to throw up our little poll for everybody? So we've got a poll. Uh, you see a boat. And uh, once you click on it, you just need to scroll down to get to questions two and three. Oh, Philip, we're actually doing one question at a time. Well, one at a time. Okay, then. Sorry. Yeah. So focus on the community aspect first. So could I just ask you, Philip, um, when you're talking about supporting the desire to be an authentic and sustainable mountain town experience for who? Well, it's for kind the of the community, like, for visitors, for everybody? For everybody. For everybody. The idea of supporting that, this thing, a mountain town experience. So it's not specifically for visitors, it's not specifically for uh, the community, it's not specifically for the industry. It's just the idea of an authentic and sustainable mountain town experience. Okay. Okay, nice. You got that, Nicole? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll move to the next one. One second. Is it on there? Oh, there it is. There you go. You need some Jeopardy theme music. Like I said, background music. Totally. OK, and the third one. Okay. And the third one. There you go. Okay. So I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. And Nicole's going to show us what that looks like on the alignment map. All right. Do you see that? So definitely visitor is most aligned, then comes the community and then stakeholders halfway there. So this would suggest that this idea is okay. It's still leaving some people out, not as tightly aligned as you'd want it to be, certainly not perfect, but there's elements in here um, that don't hurt. And uh, what I would suggest is when we get to a purpose, we want something that's a lot more evenly balanced than this, getting a lot closer to the core. 
of what's going on. Uh, now, quite interestingly, is this proposed positioning, most of it comes from uh, a tourism plan from a couple of years ago, so it was very visitor focused, and we can maybe see that a little bit in what's coming out here as well. So interesting fact point, but it's also showing that we have some alignment, alignment gaps to close. Great. Continuing on, I'm gonna start it here. All right, before we move on, or maybe we're gonna do this in our smaller groups, uh, mm -hmm. or maybe just because it was for that exercise, you wanna take us somewhere else. But I'm just wondering if, if we wanna have a conversation around this piece and whether this, these results, I mean, we produce these results. So I guess we clearly um, port them on average. But as I'm understanding this, um, what we're seeing is that the visitor, yeah, um, well, let's be careful. This is like Phillips, something to think about purpose, not okay. here. So, the fact that the visitors are closest, but I think it's interesting is that we don't have sort of that balanced perspective amongst the three groups. Like it's a, this idea is a little bit too, a little bit more visitor aligned than it is with stakeholders or the community. But what it also says to me is that at least collectively as a group, we believe the community and visitor are more aligned than the stakeholders. Is that correct? Am I interpreting that? diagram correctly? That's consistent with where you've been in the past too. Yeah. I'm okay. going to say I found this, you know, I found it hard to answer the questions because I can answer it honestly coming from the community side of things, but trying to answer the question, or maybe I wasn't supposed to, but that's how I looked at it is to answer the question from a visitor's point of view and from a stakeholders point of view and then I, I think I'm biased on that and I can't answer it correctly either. You're right Michelle and what one what we will have the ability to do later on is identify where people are coming from and answering a question like this. Mm -hmm. so can actually do it from each individual perspective. So yeah you're absolutely you could you could answer one personally and you had to guess at the others. An informed guess but a guess nonetheless. I think the surprise for me in this is that I expected the visitors to have the lowest uh, perception of this and uh, to be equal to the stakeholders and that the community would have the highest perception. I'm, I'm surprised that we think visitors view us more than just a service center for their mountain experience. Yeah, I'll agree Christy, with you, you on that, a... Norbert, too. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Sorry, I just saw Christy stand up. I'm not sure if you still mm -hmm. wanted to add something to that, yeah. Christy. Does my, can you hear me? Yes. Can, yes? Yep. Yes, okay. Yep, we can. Sorry, that's why I typed it in there. I'm just, it's not clear to me who the stakeholders are in this conversation. If we have visitors and the community. Yeah, the so stakeholders. this is, um, we went back and forth on this a couple of times in terms of getting the language really specific. What we generally mean is the tourism industry and its direct set of stakeholders. So there's a little bit of overlap with that. So it's not the person on the street community members, but it's the people connected to the tourism industry because all of these aren't perfectly clean bubbles as well. I mean, the community visitor overlaps with some types of travel. So it's a little bit tricky that way to look at it. So in that stakeholder, it's really the tourism industry engagement and alignment. Sorry, we can't make it perfectly concise, but it's it's a uh, a complicated topic. We're trying to simplify as much as possible. I'm I'm struck by that when you talk to a community member on the street, um, and they're thinking of themselves as a community member, they'll answer one way. When they go to their job at the hotel, they're now part of the stakeholder group. You know, Norbert. One of the things we want to do when we get to the survey is find out people who wearing the different hats exactly as you said right the the person who works behind the bar in a restaurant is kind of within the industry and a community member at the same time so we want to ask the right demographic question so we can look at it from a couple of different angles because i'm very curious about that as well 
And we might have a large number of people working within the industry who don't think of themselves as in the industry, or we might have quite the opposite. So that's a great observation and one we're really curious about. Any other questions or thoughts on this? Okay. Well, I'm gonna take over for Philip and we're gonna move on to another exercise together. So what I'd like us to do first, let's, I'm just gonna remind you how to use um, annotation in Zoom. So at the top of your screen, you're gonna see a green bar that says you are viewing Nicole Ferris' screen. So right at that green bar, you'll see view options, click on that. You'll see annotation, click on that. And a toolbar will pop up and I'll get you to use the stamp function for this exercise. If you can't find your annotation toolbar, that's fine. Just type your response in the chat and Jason will pop it up on the screen for you. And so what I'd like you to do is using that example purpose, an authentic and sustainable mountain town experience, select two identities that best fulfill or describe that purpose. So I'll give you a bit of time just to read through the 12 identities. And then we'll talk a little bit afterwards as to what this all means. Well, one more time of what we're looking for, looking to do. Yeah, so using the example purpose that we've been talking about, that authentic and sustainable mountain town experience, select two identities that best fulfill or describe that purpose. Great, I see we got the annotation working. Right. So lots for Explorer, lots for Sage, every person, couple for Hero, couple for Lover, some for Caregiver. Give it about 20 more seconds and then uh, we'll move on. All right, I'm going to save this. Philip, you got it saved as well? I'm all good. Okay. I, I've got it too, Nicole. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's talk a bit about what exactly that was. So that exercise is related to um, archetypes. So Carl Jung is a, was one of the founding fathers of psychology along with Sigmund Freud. Most people know who Sigmund Freud is more than they know who Carl Jung is. Um, and whereas Freud focused on sexuality and aggression, Jung's work was really focused on this idea of archetypes. So what is an archetype? What he found is that humans have a basic tendency to use symbolism to understand concepts, or in this case, brands or place brands. Um, there are 12 universal archetypes each with its own identity. So that can be characteristics, values, attitudes, behaviors, and all of that transcends time, it transcends place, culture, gender, and age. So a caregiver might generate some sort of connotations around maybe gender or age, 
but it doesn't just belong to that gender age that comes to mind. Also don't get too caught up in how they're described. Um, they have you know, different ways in which they are described. The outlaw is also known as the rebel. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways to describe them, but at its core, they are um, universal. They represent eternal truth. So they're not just stereotypical manifestations like I talked about previously. Um, and place brands are able to intrinsically relate to one or a few archetypes. Um, and by identifying with those archetypes, we're able to um, better define the brand at its core, um, definitely breathe some new life into the brand and really help to illuminate our purpose as well, which is why we got you to um, do that exercise. So a couple of examples to show you how this works. So we can use archetypes implicit in a place brand to inform a vision and vice versa. So for Calgary, the vision or brand was big dreams, big change and contribution. And the archetype that really spoke to that vision was the creator, that idea of innovation, bringing structure to the world and in every person, um, which is all about the sense of belonging and, and um, really connecting with others. And so you get a really clear sense of potentially the personality of that police brand from that archetype. And when you talk about a creator and an every person, you start to see what that brand might look like and how they might communicate that brand and what it means more than just saying big dreams, big change and contribution. Another example is Whistler. Their kind of vision brand was all around balance. And the archetype that was discovered through engagement was the gesture hero. And so you're talking about, you know, feelings of enjoyment but also mastery of skills. There's a sense of balance between these two um, uh, pieces of the, of the archetypes that are really interesting. And again, brings a little bit more structure and character to a brand or a vision. And so I'm gonna stop my screen. So Philip can show what can more look like based off of what you all um, put in the exercise. Yeah, um, I'm presuming you can see this. Yes. Uh, so um, I think this is pretty cool. Uh, Nicole and I were betting on every person an explorer, but the addition of Sage, I think is really interesting uh, idea to bring into it. Um, and so if a couple minutes ago, we'd thrown out uh, authentic and sustainable mountain town, this is ideas of understanding freedom and belonging, which is a very different place to go. It might be a very interesting place to think about in terms of a purpose of the organization. Mm -hmm. that. Um, and so this by no means is the answer, but it's yet another lens of looking at it that's quite interesting. Uh, and this might very much be uh, one of the exercises we want to bring into the community uh, as we talk about tourism, is this idea of what are the archetypes of tourism here as we consider it. We've got lots, lots of things we can do with them. Um, this is just one of the ones that we'll think about as we get there. They add a lot of color um, potentially to the framework. Uh, it's a really interesting piece that we can add. And there's a lot more analysis that goes into it beyond just getting you to identify you know, those descriptors of what you think works best with the purpose. There's a lot more that can go into it, but this is a really nice kind of articulation of, of how we can start to flesh out what those archetypes are that can inform the framework. Michelle, did you have a question? Any uh, thoughts or observations on this? Yes, Lisa. I'm just wondering, Rachel, is this a similar exercise that, that you went through? Um, because you've used some of these terms, I think, in the past. And, and does this align with, with uh, what TCK analysis says? I think we looked at different ones. Honestly, I wasn't with the organization when they went through this brand refresh. So, um, but I think we are more typical, like currently, and it was just to give a bit of context. That was done because we had to do a new website and it was quick and dirty. And I'm not sure how much engagement was done to get to the brand we have currently, but our current strategic plan actually um, we are looking at getting brand work done within the next couple of years. And this, this might be part of the puzzle, right? That's why we didn't 
start on it earlier because we knew the um, the engagement will come up with the tourism task force and we didn't want to do first of all too much tourism engagement but also see if there's alignment there already right mm -hmm. okay thank you i Just think the similarity is that travel alberta uh, using the destination canada model some of the vocabulary is the same the meaning might be different but some of the vocabulary is the same yeah absolutely we're somewhat familiar with the Destination Canada stuff, and there's totally uh, linkages. I hate that word, sorry, connections between those two things. Yes, David. I'm wondering if you can just, that, that's helpful, Norbert, the, to place where that language is familiar. So thank you for that. I was having trouble um, pigeonholing it, but I, I'm, um, I, I'm getting a little bit hung up here on brand. And I know that's not the point. I'm just wondering if you all could talk to it a little bit more to help me through. I understand that when TCK or various tourism operators or businesses market that they there is a brand, like I get all that. But really the work of this group is talking about the community, not our brand. And they're, I appreciate that they're interconnected, but I'm feeling like this is a little bit brand heavy and less about community. And I'm just wondering- sure. To Just that. to distance it from brand for a second, I think that this idea of a purpose, the brand has to follow that, right? The brand has to totally line up with the purpose. But that's all we need to worry about is you don't, want a, you don't want a destination's brand different than a destination's purpose. So we build the purpose. We build it for the community, for the visitor, for the industry. And then the brand will take care of itself after that. It's a tool that is also used in branding, but that's kind of just the application of a research tool, not making this a branding exercise. Because this is not, we'd ask a lot of very different questions if this was a branding exercise. Does that clarify it for you a little bit, Sal? Yeah, it's helpful. Thanks. Okay. I'll just add that, you know, from the archetype wheel here, a framework that is built from an explorer and every person archetype is very different than a framework that would be built from an innocent caregiver archetype as well. So it, it does feed into and help to inform potentially what that framework looks like and how it's written and what comes from it. One of the things that comes to mind when I see this, it gives me the impression that we think everybody who comes here, whether it's a weekender or a person coming up from Red Deer for the day is a very serious person. And, and there's not a lot of fun loving going on here. Uh, it's all very, you know, serious, uh, straight laced kind of thing. And I don't know if that's the right interpretation of this picture, but it makes me think there's not a lot of fun pursuits. We think there's not a lot of fun pursuits. Yeah, we'd want to dive a little bit deeper into it, Norbert, before I drew that same conclusion as you. Um, and able to having been able to compare Whistler to Canmore, uh, there is a difference in attitude between those two places around fun, for sure, that leads them to very honestly be um, an enjoyment gesture person. I'm not saying you're not, but yeah, that's the kind of thing. I mean, really, we're giving you a glimpse into a tool we can use as opposed to saying, here's the answer. Um, if we're going to go after here's the answer, we need to talk to a whole bunch more people as we do that. Uh, Martin, did you have a question before? Yeah, just wondering, um, we're doing this based on the purpose that you gave us. If we're coming up with a different purpose. Oh, absolutely, 100%. Yeah, 100%. So that was a for, for the for sake of argument only. 